Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. In today's special guest episode, I am joined by director and screenwriter Esme von Hoffman, who was the Festival of Cinema New York City 2019 winner for Best Director for her film Ovid in Love. It is set in a mashup world of contemporary Detroit, complete with togas, sneakers, hip-hop, and poetry slams, and filmed amidst the Motor City's classical ruins, graffiti, and burgeoning art scene. It is based on the life and times of the famous Roman poet Publius Ovidius Naso, or Ovid for short, who would write two particularly scandalous poems, the Amores and the Ars Amatoria, the Art of Love, both of which are filled with eroticism, sex, and romance. For these poems, plus a mistake, Ovid would find himself exiled from Rome by the Emperor Augustus. The film is available to stream on all major platforms on May 19th, 2020, and in honor of that, Esme came onto the show to talk about her background with classics and Roman history, what drew her to make a film about the life of Ovid, her artistic vision in adapting the film to a modern audience, and some of the decisions that she made in writing its script. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the award-winning director-screenwriter Esme von Hoffman. Thank you for coming on. This is awesome. I, I, I really enjoyed the film. It was really great. I watched it like three times the last couple of weeks. Like the first one was kind of for like enjoyment. I didn't even, and then the last two were kind of just like looking at it from a historical perspective. I enjoyed it more the more I looked at it from that angle. So Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, watching it and uh, having me on. And I'm glad that you enjoyed it. <laughs> I saw that you won an award for it last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had our festival premiere at Festival of Cinema in New York City. And yeah, I won for Best Director. So that was exciting. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. So you are the director and the writer, right? You wrote? Yes. Awesome. It's going to release May 19th. Is it going to be straight to streaming? Yeah. So unfortunately, in this day and age, we are not because of COVID, we cannot do a theatrical release. Um, however, it's a great time for streaming and people need content for when they're at home. And I hope that this uh, movie provides, I think one of the messages of the movie is about resilience of people and empires and cities. And I hope that perhaps this can, you know, bring a hopeful note in a time which is very um sad and and hard mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> and also distraction <laughs> it's called Ovid and the art of love so it's based on the life of one of the most famous roman poets publius ovidius naso or Ovid. do you have a classics background or a, how did you come to Ovid? like what drew you to this story specifically and Ovid the poet or rome in general I started my interest in classics when I was younger. I guess uh, I was lucky enough to go to a school actually where fourth grade was the year we studied ancient Greece. So I actually came to my love of the classics through ancient Greece. So it makes me excited to be on this podcast. And I was very interested in the, the Greek myths back then. But I think something that also has always fascinated me historically are the beginnings of things. So um, I was... That's why I got into ancient Greece too. I like the origins of things. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So I was fascinated by sort of the, the beginnings of democracy. Um, I'm also very interested in theater. Uh, in college, I double majored in history and theater. Great theater, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think I wrote a, a long-term paper on, you know, the beginnings of theater and, you know, how the first goat singer stepped out of the line of chorus. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and then through that, so that sort of, I think that was sort of an introduction to the ancient world for me. Um, but I, I loved it so much that I wanted to keep studying it. And then um, in high school, they didn't offer ancient Greek at the time, but they offered Latin. <laughs> um, so I took it. I started out with Latin first too, as well, in college, actually. Oh, cool. I mean, there's a lot of overlap because I feel like um, Ovid, you know, metamorphoses are a lot of Greek myths. So it was I got to read those um, in Latin, which was great. So uh, through that, I got to Ovid. And I also uh, studied Ovid in history classes, too. And I really loved the fact that he was sort of this amusing sort of, but kind of average person compared to a lot of the people that you study in Greece and Rome. He wasn't a ruler or anything, um, who was sort of the one person that I felt really managed to stick it to the Emperor Augustus, who was this... Sort of tyrannical uh, leader. I sort of love that story of sort of just the average person who, um, you know, self-described frivolous poet who stands up to this 
authoritarian ruler. And that really stuck with me. And also, um, when I first read Ovid, I read it in a Latin class where I had a lot of people who were from all different backgrounds and nationalities. And it really was, um, we could sort of all come together. I don't know, we found him relatable, essentially. <laughs> and, you know, he was humorous, and he sort of seemed like I think we can get along with him. I don't know if you are familiar with the book Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. I have read that. It's, it's really good. Yeah, it's great. So, like, the idea um, of that there's, you know, these sort of epic stories from all different cultures around the world and all different times, and the reason they stay with us are these, these elements that sort of have this deep visceral way of moving us, and I think that's that's very true of Ovid and perhaps why, you know, the classics in general uh, sort of resonate through time and cultures. When I first started taking Latin in college, uh, we used the Latin via Ovid textbooks. It, it was, you know, like adapted passages of the Metamorphoses. And then, so that was like my first year. And then my second year, we read Caesar. But then the second semester, it was Catullus and Ovid's love poetry. So we read some of the Amores and some of the Ars Amatoria. But that was like a decade ago. <laughs> I haven't actually read the poems beforehand. So maybe I need to go back and do that. But they were some of the more interesting poems that I've ever read in Latin. I wasn't quite as young as the kid in the film is, but I was, a, you know, college age kid. And, you know, it was interesting and talking about sex. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that is something that really resonates with Ovid, particularly with the younger crowd, which is sort of why it, this movie can be enjoyed on many levels. But on one level, it's a coming of age story because I think Ovid. Um, particularly in his earlier poems, which he wrote when he was younger, um, does feel very like fresh and relatable. So that's interesting. So did you choose the Ovid story more so for his um, authoritarian like pushback against Augustus and less about the actual text, Ars Amatoria, or was it just, you know, those are all wrapped up together? Then we'll get into that, but that was kind of like part of his uh, pushback. Or do you see like some specific like in during appeal to the text. I guess let me rephrase this. Was it the text that drew you more to it or the the consequences of the text? Well, I think that they're somewhat like a mesh because I think one of the things to me that had struck me about Ars Amatoria that made it so like funny and noteworthy was how irreverent it was <laughs> because he was telling people in this time where they were trying to like crack down and say, you know, nobody can have love affairs and all this sort of moral values that they were putting on, which was of the tip of critical of the Emperor Augustus, because <laughs> many historians will, uh, Roman historians note um, that he was not necessarily following his own laws, that, you know, he was saying like, oh, you know, go find a lover at uh, the Empress Livia's portico, for instance, these sort of sacred spots. So I think that was uh, part of it. I think what's interesting about Ovid, sorry, one of the other things that's interesting, there are many interesting things about Ovid, but his, his, the type of his poetry varies so much and you really sort of see a change through time and you almost can understand how he sort of grows up through his poetry. So, you know, it's true that what I really like about, you know, our armatoria is slightly different than what I like about metamorphosis. So I suppose with metamorphosis, that's more like the beauty of the poetry. And also there's still a good amount of humor. I um, remember when I first translated him, you know, when I was young <laughs> or younger, I laughing a lot as I as I translated it because I found it funny, but it's also very beautiful and, and moving at times too. Have you ever read the uh, the Fasti as well? It's it's completely different than our Zomatory as well. I read that when I took a Roman religion class in college. You know, they talk about the uh, the Roman religious calendar. He details all that sort of like what happens, what's the significance of all these events, and it's just like. Hmm, the same poet wrote both of these. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I touched on it. It's, you know, clearly doesn't make it into the movie as much, but no, it's amazing. And then even you get into what Tristi at the end of his life, and it's um, very interesting to see. And then, the, like, of course, the Morris, which is the first one, you know, that's very, to me, feels very much like sort of adolescent love, you know? And then he gets sort of. And it is sort of the obsession with Corinna, and then he gets jaded. Ars Armatoria is the more sort of jaded piece. To me, there feels like a maturity in a metamorphosis, <laughs> where he's sort of like almost this deeper wisdom comes in, perhaps even more so in, in his last poem. So yeah, it is, it's interesting to me to see, you know, I mean, 
Virgil kind of has a voice and sticks to that voice. So I think it's unusual that he changes his voice so much and sort of reinvents himself. And I think that was, so I guess that's where it's a bit one in the same, right? Because, you know, I, as a filmmaker, you can't make a movie. If I just liked his poetry, unfortunately, there wouldn't be a movie to make because you need a story, right? But I will say that I do feel like the poetry, because in some ways it very much tells the story of his life, uh, really helped me flesh out the story. And, you know, certainly if I hadn't found him so funny and irreverent and so human through his poetry and so relatable that I thought could be so relatable to a modern audience. I also might not have chosen this, but he is so relatable that I thought, wow, this is, this is something that I think people would get a kick out of and they could relate to. And I, you know, I'd seen my own, you know, classmates feel this way. And then I actually, I made a short film first. I, I saw something about that. I couldn't find it online though. When I was looking, it was 2009, right? I don't think it was that long ago. I think it was more like 2012. Well, but a while back. Time is cyclical, especially in the days of COVID. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of an experiment. I got some, you know, film friends and I got some actor friends and uh, we did this. And then I screened it a number of places, um, including like in New York. We had a screening um, at the new school and we had a very diverse audience, people from different backgrounds. And something I was struck by is that people came up to me and they were like, oh, it's so natural. And these characters were wearing togas and sneakers <laughs> in the short. And it was filmed in like a back lot uh, in New York City. And that was one of the things that encouraged me to move forward with the feature is because it was interesting to me. It confirmed my feeling about Ovid previously, which is that people felt he was very relatable <laughs> and it felt very modern. And even though... He's from Rome. He just felt his story felt very modern and relatable and and natural. And that's what, you know, got me excited to one of the things that got me excited to keep moving forward with the the larger uh, feature film. So I have a few more questions on the poems, but we'll get to that a little bit later because I, I do want to uh, get into the film a little bit. The film is a uh, it's like a mashup of a contemporary Detroit, as you mentioned, with togas and sneakers and hip hop and like poetry slams, and it's filmed amid the ruins and art scene and graffiti of dilapidated part of Detroit, I suppose. What is your connection with Detroit? I'm just curious what led you to Detroit to use that. Seems unusual, but I mean, I think it fit and meshed well, especially when you think of Rome, you kind of have like classical ruins, and a lot of people have this impression of Detroit as being in a state of ruin right now, so it's kind of apropos, I suppose. Yeah, so I uh, I have family roots in the industrial Midwest. And then also, I guess when I was looking to expand it into a feature, I think the thing that people really enjoyed about, or one of the things that people really enjoyed about it was that it was about, the short was about Rome, but it was really about us in current times. Um, and so how, um, when it was no longer going to be a six minute movie, did we expand um, to make it, sort of bigger uh, cross between contemporary and ancient. And I cannot tell you the moment it popped into my mind, but I, I kind of think in my head it was just, of course, you know, <laughs> Detroit is, you know, America's bygone industrial empire. The ruins of Rome and the ruins of Detroit sort of popped into my head. But I think also Detroit, like Rome, there's such a great artistic tradition there. And even though there are ruins, these amazing, you know, it keeps bringing back and there's just a really amazing creative community out there. And we were so lucky to be able to work with all these artists that were working to bring back Detroit, you know, very distressed, particularly after 2009 and lost a lot of population. In developing it, it wasn't like I just said, okay, I'm going to go do this. But I, you know, started talking to people I knew in Detroit and sort of saying, like, what do you think about this? Do you feel like this would be um, true to your city? Because I wanted it to be sort of organic and I didn't want to feel like I was coming in and like imposing something. And yeah, people had great input and really liked the idea. And in fact, you know, I, I learned so much through collaborating with people in Detroit and, you know, something that a early producer said was, you know, I first 
floated the idea of the project, you know, said like, oh, it's amazing because we, at the time they just had their democracy taken away a little bit like Rome at this point in its history um, because they had an emergency manager put in at that point. They were not allowed to elect a mayor, unlike, you know, every other city in the United States. So there, are, I think there were a lot of sort of overlap. And then the other great thing is that Rome has a lot, I mean, sorry, Rome definitely has classical architecture. Detroit has a lot of neoclassical architecture. It has this incredible architecture and there's a lot of columns. And I think because, it, you know, it was this you know great center of, you know, America's industrial empire. And so there's incredible um, locations that we were able to make use of. And we were really lucky that our, you know, locations team and um, also, you know, secure these, these fantastic locations which you know turned into Augustus's palace or other places like that. The film was finished last year. When did you start on it? How long did the process take? I guess how long did it take you to put the masterpiece together? <laughs> well technically we were still putting finishing touches on it this year but just you know just final <laughs> things but yes I mean a film is a film's a long process so you know I mean you make like your short and then you start writing and I've never made a film, so I don't, I don't know the process. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's taken a number of years, uh, essentially. I had to write it, and that took a while, and then, you know, start sort of casually shopping it. And then, you know, we got amazing producers on board, amazing cast, and we uh, filmed it. And, and then post-production takes a while, too. But here we are. <laughs> I do have a few questions, and we can get, get on it as it uh, progresses about some of your uh, writings of some of the characters. We'll get into that then. <laughs> I was fascinated, by the way, some of them were portrayed and had a few questions. But um, I guess we'll start with, you know, talk about the setting. The film begins and kind of alluded to this already. You have this young boy that's in a classroom and it seems a lot like how you learned Latin from Ovid. He was given a copy of Ovid. I think he had the art of love on him, but he had something of Ovid. And I guess he's a young teenage boy, so maybe he's in need of some romantic advice himself as he enters adulthood. And, he becomes completely engrossed in Ovid's story. And so he goes to this warehouse and he just starts to read the book. And it play gets very meta and I liked it. It's as if he was like immersed in this book that has he's just daydreamed about it over and over again. Characters are very intimate to him. What led you to choose the kid passionate about Ovid and daydreaming about the situation occurring as opposed to you know, just the situation occurring? Yeah, so I think in certain ways, Jamal, who's the character's name, very much represents like me and my friends studying Latin. It's, it's sort of, in certain ways, this movie is fantasy or um, expressionistic. So it's sort of, it's not, as you can tell from the fiction design, you know, people in Rome did not actually wear togas and sneakers. It's sort of his imagining of what Rome must be like. So, you know, pulling in modern elements to the Roman elements. Yeah, so it was it was somewhat inspired by classmates and then also it's a, sort of a way to get to get into that world um, and sort of understand Rome through a modern lens. I liked it. It was different. <laughs> okay, thank you. You see it in theater a little bit more. I uh, worked in the theater. I've spent, I majored in theater back in the day. And so I'm influenced by the theater as well. And I've seen some amazing productions on stage. Very different play. Like for instance, uh, there was a production of Our Town, which does the whole show uh, with the lights on. And so you're looking at like everybody in the audience and you're like, how am I ever going to concentrate on this action? But it's so naturally done that, by the end, you're like, oh, I couldn't imagine without the lights because it shows, you know, our connection to this play, which I believe is, you know, turn of the century. <laughs> it makes it feel so vivid and alive. So stuff like that was inspiration. That's not playing the classics, but I do think there have been really effective um, theatrical updatings of older stories. And because I thought those worked so well, I wanted to try it in film. I'm not saying that it's different from what you see in the film industry now. It's different from classics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Although I would argue this actually came up in the uh, casting a number of times. I kept getting questions about like, oh, do you want British accent? That always <laughs> struck me as funny. But I think we see so many uh, British movies about Rome that people have started to think that that's how Romans are. But at the time that this movie is set, I think only part of Britain was conquered by the Romans and that's sort of an outpost of the Roman Empire 
in actually, you know, a lot of the Roman Empire, it's, you know, the Mediterranean and the Middle East and Northern Africa. So I think we sort of have forgotten that it's a more, I guess, by modern standards, multicultural empire than it was. And so I'd like to think that this movie goes back to that a little bit, uh, because I think that's been forgotten in a lot of the portrayals. Um, And back then, you know, a big divide was between like Northern Europe and the Roman Empire. So, you know, like the Germanic people were considered barbarians because they were outside the Roman Empire. So it was a very different sort of breakdown um, than what we see now, which is, I don't think, usually reflected in a lot of sort of contemporary (laughs) movies about Rome. Absolutely. So you have the meta angle that kicks in and you start seeing characters introduced. Ovid's played by Corbin Blue, and they start out talking about peace, the Pax Augusta, as it's called. And then you immediately get Augustus, played by John Savage. I like the way you portray Augustus. He's shown immediately executing some suspected people who had ties with Mark Antony. And Augustus is portrayed, I think, basically as a mob boss or a gang leader, basically a bully. And I kind of love that representation of him. I guess that falls back into the authoritarian, like, you know, it's going to push back against that type of mentality, but it also very, you know, it gave like a modern gang leader. Is that kind of what you were going for? Or is that kind of just how it naturally came about? Oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't specifically thought that, but it's certainly like, yeah, I mean, I guess we were going for modern, so that may have been how it came out. I certainly think Augustus is a very um, divisive character <laughs> and, and in discussions with other sort of classicists and people who just love the classics, you know, some people see him as this, you know, person who brought great infrastructure to Rome, you know, which he certainly did. But then there's the sort of other side where he essentially snuffs out democracy in Rome. So I you know, tend to be a little harder on him. (laughs) But I also think that um, John Savage does like a really incredible job of of bringing out the humanity in him and sort of showing the sort of decisions that you have to make as a ruler. And they're not always easy if you want to consolidate power. So I think that was very important to bring out in Augustus as well. Tying into this, after that, you get introduction of Julia, the elder, or major, as it's sometimes called in Latin. I guess Agrippa recently died. She's immediately told that she needs to marry her stepbrother, Tiberius. And she kind of pushes back against it. And I kind—I really like this line. His henchman, which is Lepidus, and I kind of want to come back to Lepidus, though. But when she refuses, she says that this isn't a monarchy or dictatorship. And they all just kind of look at each other. <laughs> that was a pretty powerful scene. This is kind of where it's going. And then they get married. So Lepidus, is this just a random character named Lepidus? Or are you, is that the triumvir Lepidus? The real triumvir Lepidus was out of the picture in this point. Oh, yeah, by like 20 years. But I didn't even take artistic license to bring him back. Yeah, so he's not not really, but I think I love, I don't know, something about Lepidus felt evil and, you know, the idea of Lepidus as a sidekick. But um, no, it's not. I did take the name, but it's not the same character. He actually felt like a henchman, which is kind of why I got that feeling of like a mob boss with Augustus, because that was kind of like his muscle and or get it done guy. But yeah, I think maybe that sense that I've had, (laughs) Augustus essentially snuffs out his enemies, which is, you're right, I hadn't ever thought of it as in terms of mob boss, but that is what they do. (laughs) Or that's what, at least in the popular this made you. So I, I think that that's always sort of been my sense of Augustus. And in fact, I was digging out some old papers and I saw that I had uh, gotten in a back and forth with an ancient history teacher <laughs> a while back. And in terms of ter- interpretation of sources, she felt that um, it was more cooperative. But, you know, there are definitely people that say there, there wasn't anybody left to object to him, <laughs> essentially, because he'd gotten rid of all of his enemies. So speaking of like chronology, I liked how you mixed and matched the chronology with this film. Whereas, you know, Ovid goes to Rome and he starts his legal education and then he becomes a poet. And, you know, that happens like 20 years maybe-ish earlier than the whole Julia stuff that happens. But I think it made the coming back and forth between scenes kind of made it more powerful because he technically didn't write the Amores until before Julia got exiled. It was like, 
think the 15 BC, 16 BC, and she got exiled in what? Well, she married Tiberius in 11 BC, and then so, and she got exiled like six or something. Yeah, so <laughs> or two, I think it was two. My chronology is the dates may not be exactly, but I did like how you kind of just like kind of had two threads of the stories going at one time. Well, I guess there was more than two threads, but those two different threads. It would have been not as powerful had you did it chronologically. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges of doing a feature movie is that you have to compact everything in you know, between 90 and 120 pages, right? So if you're going to tell a story that takes place over time, you need to do it efficiently. So I think one of the things um, to go back to the framing device of seeing it through Hell's Head is that I, I hope that that would allow us a little bit more leeway to get at sort of the, I feel, you know, hopefully like the themes, but not you know, I, we set up that this is not going to be like 100% historically, the main points are historically accurate. But you know, there are certainly liberties that we take, you know, and so if you really want to know the dates and how everything lined up, probably best to go consult a history book. But if you want to sort of get a general sense of what happened, and the various um, tensions and you know, conflicts going on and Ovid's movie, uh, sorry, not Ovid's, Ovid's poetry, <laughs> this touches on it all. Well, he did write some theater plays as well, so. <laughs> yeah, now I'm mixing ancient and modern. I completely agree. I'm someone who doesn't really get big into the historical accuracy of certain films. I watch them for what they are. And, you know, most of these type of films are meant to, this reception of classics are meant to reach an audience and, you know, pique their interest in a topic and you can go and learn more it's not meant to be like a documentary <laughs> yeah exactly like we would love for people to go and read Ovid and you know learn about the Augustan world but it, yes it is not a documentary <laughs> precisely so another major theme throughout the, the film is this you kind of alluded to it is this it's a time of peace the Pax Augusta but it's not like a fruitful time for everybody I really like that you had the protesters with signs that we are the 96%. <laughs> There's just so much background tension between the supposed peace, but then you have this financially insecure proletariat, the, the lower classes who are jobless and increasingly restless and lacking food and no benefits and veterans who aren't being taken care of and that sort of thing. And it's kind of very resonant of modern times as you were alluded to earlier, how like this type of film has an enduring appeal or this type of time period has an enduring appeal. And you see so many people who always make these comparisons between like, are we wrong? Where in the pendulum of like the first century BC are we? Some comparisons are better than others, but like some of the type of like this tension that you see is that's like a running theme throughout, which, you know, with the whole Detroit scene, it kind of just hits it even more as we alluded to earlier. Yeah, well, something that struck me in doing my research, and I'm, I'm glad that it resonated with you, um, is that essentially, you know, it's, you hear about sort of the Pax Augusta, this sort of time of peace, but then when you read the sources more carefully, they talk about, you know, like famines and wars, and, you know, there's, I believe it's Suetonius who talks about a time where the people are so fed up, they're almost the point of revolution. So it's not all as smooth <laughs> as history or Augustus himself, who is sort of this great, you know, publicity person himself in terms of talking his own rule up and in getting other poets to write uh, like Virgil, you know, flattering things about his rule. And I think that that, I mean, I guess, I mean, that's true of any sort of probably large country or time period or whatever, you know, it's, it can be good times for some people, but not good times for other people or, you know, it may be very peaceful in this one area, but in, you know, overseas, there's fighting or, you know, on the border, there's fighting. So, um, you know, I think that's a very um, sort of looking for yeah things that still resonate, um, but also, you know, history tends to repeat itself. So, you know, that was one of the things I was sort of struck by, like, oh, this feels familiar. So um, trying to bring out things that, again, would, would resonate with the modern audience, but were also true to Rome. So now we talked about the underlying socio-political tensions. Let's move to the main appeal of the film, I suppose, is the the sexual sexcapades of Julia, the poems of Ovid. So you start out talking about Julia. I mean, I think she's there for like the first 20, 30 minutes or so um, until she gets like exiled. 
but Augustus has passed a lot of legislation promoting quote unquote traditional Roman and family values. And part of that is the law against adultery. And, and one of the, the more funnier scenes, I, I thought at least, um, she had a secret meeting with some public rebels. And she has this discussion with an elder man named Senex. He's just supposed to be representative of the older Senate that doesn't really have any power and it's kind of like neutered politically. They have a secret meeting with these rebels to determine how to fix the hunger problem and how to, you know, bring back the Republic, so to speak. <laughs> she says she's going to solve it with fellatio. <laughs> and she's very outspoken against her father's power grab. It's, it's a very funny scene. But, and then she gets exiled, you know, which is 2 BC on the historical record. It takes her quite a while to actually get exiled. But, you know, according to the sources, take them for what they're worth. She was very scandalous. <laughs> She was always one of my favorite characters. Yeah, I think Tara Summers, who plays her, does such a great job. And yeah, I, I remember when I was, you know, like reading the primary Roman historian sources and I got to this part where it's like she, you know, bargains sexual favors in a public square and I'm thinking like, oh man, how am I going to write that one? <laughs> but she's also historically known to be, have been very smart and very witty and was, you know, essentially forced by her father to marry and give birth to kids to further his ambition. So it was really interesting to me to think about on a human level what that must have been like for her and how that must have taken its toll on how when you had somebody um, who's sort of as spirited as she was, how she, she might have lashed out and rebelled. So um, that was a bunch of the inspiration for you know, her story. And in the film, she's not really liked a whole lot by her uh, stepmother. <laughs> and I guess her, her stepmother and her mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Those Romans. <laughs> <laughs> so moving back to Ovid, who's the main man of the film. So he gets to Rome and he starts becoming educated in law. He doesn't really like it. In actual history, he eventually leaves and he travels around in, in the 20s and starts getting big into poetry. But I like how you, it kind of felt like he was like a modern law student in, like in contemporary times. And he was just kind of struggling morally with some of the stuff that he had to do. And I liked how he was called a practical poet. And that's what he became known as. And then specifically, while he was like struggling to write love poetry, Agrippina, was she at all related in the film to the Augustan family? No, she wasn't supposed to be. Okay, it was just a name? Okay, I thought so. Yeah, <laughs> there were limited Roman names, so <laughs> in the spirit of authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, you need to be more like Virgil and start writing farmer's manuals. <laughs> and I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have never really been a big fan of Virgil's poetry. I know some Latinists might not uh, like me for that. Well, he's not as much fun as Ovid. <laughs> Let's be. Virgil's hired by Augustus, and he's you know supposed to sing and Rome's praises. And he, in my mind, you know, Ovid's more fun because <laughs> he's the sort of radical one who follows his passion. <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, I watched the film a couple times. The first time, I didn't really pick up on the fact that his love interest was Karina. Was her name? And so the second time I watched it through, I was like, oh, she's the one that is in the Amores and is actuality. Like, that's who he pens it to. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. I like that detail. But um, we don't really know if Karina is an actual person or not. I'm sure you're familiar with this. But just for listeners, it could just be a poetic construct. Or I've actually read somewhere where Karina seems to be a pun on the Greek word kore or maiden, which, you know, I love puns. So I kind of hope that that's the case in the film she's like this hot late 20s or so married woman who married against her will not against her will it was arranged marriage well I guess it's against her will she's a woman in Rome so he gets this reputation as like this kind of when he's at these poetry slams you called it the olive tree so I, that was awesome <laughs> <laughs> uh, as like this virgin love poet and his poetry like he kind of reminds me of people who like bomb at the Apollo he was getting like booed on stage and then he decided I need to go have a love affair with this woman who captures attention and in turn his poetry improves I like the character of Karina what inspiration did you have to write that was it just what was found in the Amores yeah I think the Amores was a big inspiration that's how I got to Karina and 
Yeah, I guess also in his development, I think she's sort of, you. I think one of the questions that this movie asks, it's Ovid in the Art of Love and sort of what is love? And hopefully sort of throughout the movie, we get sort of different ideas of what love is. So Corinna is sort of, I think, turns out to be more superficial love, you know? You also make that in the scenes too, like, like when he starts his affair with her and some of his poetry is improving and his, his crowds are loving him and then... Like he realizes that she has another lover and then his like poetry takes a different turn. He's like a spurned lover at that time. And you actually use lines from the Amores on the stage. I liked that historical attention to detail there. That was, it was pretty, like, I was like, oh, I remember that line. Except I don't think he called out people in a slam poetry setting for their not knowing where to find women in that one scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll never know. So <laughs> I suppose maybe he did, but yes, um, that might've been one of the, <laughs> the sort of fun liberties that we took in, um, or I took in making this updating it. But I did like the idea because um, poetry was essentially a, medium that was spoken out loud back then. Um, I guess there's been some debate about whether people even read to themselves at all. A lot of people think that they didn't. Some scholars think that they did. But regardless, it's it's very much an oral form back then. So I think of the poetry slam as actually, in terms of modern day, it's sort of perhaps one of the more accurate ways um, to show the way he would have shared his poetry um, since it was said aloud. But then we were always looking for where sort of modern and ancient worlds intersected. (laughs) So then we really, once that sort of decision of the poetry slam was made, we really got into it. And um, in fact, um, Michael Ellison, who plays Octavius, who's the the MC for the poetry slam, uh, is a real spoken word artist. And um, and who plays Virgil, his Trey, he also is spoken word art. So we have a lot of a lot of real spoken word artists <laughs> thrown in there to try to give it a really authentic flavor. And some of the chants that they're doing are actual like sort of Detroit spoken word chants that you might hear at a and an actual poetry slam in Detroit. So there was a bunch of Latin chants in there too. Yeah. So we sort of mixed it up to meld it, but it was fun like literally as we filmed it seeing those those worlds coming together and the poetry slam scenes at the olive tree were just incredibly fun because the the energy in the in the room and you know with all extras who are you know Detroiters <laughs> and there were also you know artists and poets in the the audience too and it was just this uh, really fun thing and there were Michael Ellison who played Octavius had these games where he was like the right side was against the left side and trying to cheer loudly and um, it was just a really spirited fun thing where you're sort of seeing this living poetry slam coming to life which is partly uh, Roman poetry and partly um, you know this contemporary world so it was it was super cool to see it it was especially cool to see like his development too, which, you know, that goes back to the Karina. She's more up there as like a helps with his maturation process and not just development as a poet, but the confidence in the film, at least as his confidence improved, his poetry improved. And that was a big part, as you can tell throughout his maturation process and seeing eventually becomes the talk of the town and falls on Augustus's radar for his scandalous poetry. Let's just say, though his poetry itself isn't like very graphic in terms of sexual acts. It's not overly graphic, I wouldn't say. So, I mean, I guess it's appropriate for the young teen reader who's reading it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more irreverent and yes, it's lively, but it, yeah, it's not. It's not certainly not too explicit. So eventually he you know, gets on Augustus's radar and, and then he gets arrested uh, and then he comes across as Julia, the younger which I like the fact that she was the first woman in the film that he kind of hits on, but after he becomes practical poet. And I didn't realize that that's who that was at first. And I like that back connection. And then he realizes like years later that that's who that was. And then he is given a fine and he's let go unexpectedly. Thanks to Karina. And he quits love poetry because of the work on the metamorphoses, which, you know, he does write that later in life and history. And I like how you wrote the character of not just Julia the Elder, but Julia the Younger as well. Um, We talk about her a little bit. She's this, there's not a whole lot about her. And what we do know about her is, you know, 
as most women in the ancient world, especially the imperial women or powerful women, they kind of have slander written against them from the uh, upper class senatorial rank males who are the source writers. In the film, she's connected to this political opposition with her brother, Agrippa Posthumus, who himself was exiled. He had been Augustus's heir at one point, and he was banished for, there's no consensus as to why, but, you know, it's probably Livia's doing, just to promote Tiberius. But in the film, um, you have Julia sneaking her brother back in, and they kind of have this, like, secret underground organization to kind of reestablish the Republic and get rid of you know, the Augustus hereditary line. And it's more unlike where, say, you have like Brutus and Cassius and them with Julius Caesar. They're doing this more because of the care for the suffering of the people. So I really liked how you wrote that in there. What led you to portray Julia in that light and use her as such a big character towards the end in that way? Yeah, great question. Well, I think there's some, you know, rivalry between Agrippa Postumus and Tiberius. I mean, this is part of a movie where it's sort of, filling out speculation because we don't really know <laughs> Ovid and I believe Julia too because there are some you know theories that their exile was related <laughs> to each other and so I guess I sort of yeah <laughs> took that and ran with it and all we know from Ovid right is that he says that he was exiled for a poem and a mistake so I was thinking about what like their connection might be and that there was these sort of factions and sort of what Ovid was about and how it feels like he's more representative of the sort of everyday Roman. And so sort of, I think, you know, she's in certain ways, the true love. They have a deeper relationship than his early relationship, it feels like. And thinking about like what connection that would be. And then also um, given, you know, the elder Julia's, the difficulty that she'd faced father and that she was so smart and intuitive sort of thinking like what that might have grown into <laughs> had she stuck around i don't think you mentioning julia is gonna spoil anything i mean like you turned her into such a big character that's kind of the inevitable conclusion you're gonna get is that like yeah. <laughs> she was the mistake <laughs> or like part of the mistake she became such a big character towards the second half of the play Ovid had like a fascination with her even when he was still with karina and like a different level of fascination, as you at least in your film, that was not a, a sexual one. I mean, he may have had sexual feelings. I don't know, but <laughs> it was not like a, a an affair or anything. Though, and supposedly, she did have an affair with a senator that did get her exiled and get into that. So she could have. That's part of some of the theories. But yeah, in your film, they're both later arrested, and then there's a trial, and I, I liked the trial. Like how, how you portrayed it. Augustus was reading lines from the Amores and the Ars Amatoria to try and prove that, like, he thought everybody, like, even married women, should, you know, be pursued against his laws. And then, and then Ovid quipped back with, like, lines from the Metamorphosis saying, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think women should be turned into trees either, even though I wrote that. <laughs> and that made me laugh. That was, that was, that was brilliant. And then uh, in the play, Julia speaks up and saves them both from being executed. And you can kind of see, as you were saying with John Savage, like the character in Augustus, the way he portrayed his, like, he was like holding back tears. I would imagine, no matter what you feel about the actual historical Augustus, to have to uh, exile both your daughter and your granddaughter would be something that is just, would be one of the hardest things that you would have to do, even for like a mob boss gang leader type of character. It would be just absolutely devastating. and You could just tell that he, on the one hand, doesn't want to give nepotism, which you can respect, especially in lieu of current politics. On the other hand, he doesn't want to rid himself of his family because, you, you know, we struggle with our family too. No matter what they may do, they're still family, for the most part. Some people can cut people off pretty easily. So it was a very powerful scene. And then I don't know if I want to talk about the ending or not, I don't want to give the ending. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Maybe we can save the surprise, but we can talk in broad strokes. I was going to, if you don't mind, hop on to what you were saying about sort of Augustus making that decision about, you know, exiling his family. And yeah, that I think that was cool to do the movie because you really have to, and when you write a movie, you really have to, to do a good job of writing a screenplay. You have to really sort of 
internally get into what that character is thinking. And so, you know, Augustus, so often those marble statues and this, you know, great long emperor who ruled Rome for so long, but really, you know, thinking about like, what is a, you know, human being like, what are the trade offs like that you have to to do and the hard decisions that you have to make. And um, John Savage, um, to prepare for that scene, he and um, Tamara, who plays uh, Julia II, they did all these improvs to sort of build up the connection that they had when she was, you know, a little girl and, and to sort of really viscerally feel that so that, which I think makes the, it such an emotionally deep scene when he has to make that decision because they really like to prepare for that, um, you know, delve into sort of that really that deep connection they had. So when it has to be broken, you don't really see it in their faces. And even Julia, like they have a very touching conversation afterwards between Ovid and Julia. And she is like, thanks Ovid for remembering how she truly felt about her grandfather. Just like, you know, human beings are complex. Like we can appreciate good qualities and good experiences we've had with people and still be kind of disgusted in other things about them. And it's just, it foot stomps that like, you know, you can love your family for the memories that you've had growing up with them. But just still like, if they've done certain things, murdered people, you know, you can still be just like appalled by that. And there's nuance in humanity. That was a touching last 10, 15 minutes or however long it was. And then you get into the ending. I'm not going to spoil. I didn't see that coming. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess that's a, a sign of a good screenwriter. <laughs> I didn't see the ending coming. Oh, good. Um, yes, but I will say without saying what it is that I think there's uh, some good historical evidence that that sort of thing was going on <laughs> for anyone who questions the veracity of it. Just not specificity. What I didn't see coming, I guess, is what I should say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so I, I don't want to ruin that, so we won't talk about that. But the movie does end, and I really like the way you actually end the movie with the kid. I think you said his name was Jamal. Yeah. And now he's back in contemporary world. And then he, he sees this girl that he likes, and it's like, he just spent that entire, like, immersion learning how to talk to women. And so he's like, has this huge smile on his face and it like cuts out. Like that brings the whole meta scene all the way back. It was a fantastic ending. Yeah. I hope that there's some hope in the ending. He's gone through this and he's hopefully come out smarter. And also, you know, I hope that somewhat we see in sort of the the everlasting nature of Ovid's poems and sort of the spirit of arts of Rome and then he looks into his own city which is coming back and you know hopefully the parallel with the sort of the resilience that you know Ovid goes on and and other artists go on too. So will this be your last dabbling in the classical world or do you have a follow-on project after this? I am working on a couple of TV pilots. Neither of them touch on the the classical world but I certainly would be delighted if I got to do another project with the ancient world that would be that would be wonderful i know the whole industry is a little turned upside down by covid and uh, a lot of talk about having to write you know scenes that are you know just one or two people that are six feet away from each other i guess i didn't really think about that kind of hard to start projects right now unless you're going back kicking at greek theater old school where you only have like two people and they all just change out masks well, three people eventually. <laughs> but. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's a time where people are sort of having to rethink how we do stuff. So it, you know, may be harder. I hope I'm wrong, but it may be harder for the foreseeable future to do more sort of elaborate costume drama pieces. But, you know, I certainly am hoping for many reasons that we get through this and can start making movies about classics and different times and characters and get people excited about those other fascinating pockets of ancient history as well well i hope even if you don't get around to doing anything classics related for a while that you still read some of the texts in your spare time and you know engage with it it seems like you've had a long history with it so i was very curious what your background with classics was going into this because from the trailer i was like okay there's some interesting angles here and then i watched the film and i was like Mm -hmm. okay she has to have some familiarity with ovid i'm excited to have learned that you're intimately familiar with Hobbit and Roman history. So that's great. Yeah. And I was a, I was a history major too. And I just love history. 
even better. <laughs> yeah, like in college, I took a course on the city of Rome. So we learned a lot about sort of like daily life stuff. And then um, in researching this movie, and I went and I really did look at a lot of, you know, primary sources and Roman sources. And um, I also went to Rome and <laughs> found a lot of the places that either Ovid mentions or might have walked in and also other characters like Augustus or I found they have these um it's in a Roman museum but like you know walls from Livia's chambers and uh just to sort of you know I I feel like everything helps you know you sort of feel what it would be like and bring more authenticity to it oh absolutely my senior year in college I studied abroad in both Greece and Italy and it was I mean I liked the ancient world beforehand but that was kind of what solidified it for me just being on site and seeing things and being in the museums and just being where it happened it was just kind of powerful I understood things more I would imagine if you're going to write a script on Ovid it's best to go to Rome and just kind of just immerse yourself it can't possibly do anything but help the creativity yeah, absolutely. And I remember um, getting into the Roman Forum and Palatine Hill and you, you going through this, like you have to go like underground to get up into it because it's fenced off. But it was like, I almost like felt the world like springing up around me. But yeah, it's it's certainly, certainly magical when you get to go to and see these places. Well, it was so nice talking with you. Yeah, for sure. I definitely, I enjoyed this. I really enjoyed your film. I wish there were more classic space films like this. Well, I thank you for doing this podcast. And I've enjoyed listening. Like I thought uh, I listened to the the singer who does the Homeric Odyssey. Oh, Joe. Yeah, that was so cool. <laughs> like, it's just it's it's really exciting to me all like the different facets of the classics community. So cool. Well, we'll definitely stay in touch. I'll look forward to listening to it. It was really wonderful talking to you. And I your podcast is fantastic. So I'll, I'll look forward to keep listening. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you.